esteemed guests, honorable principals and teachers, and respectful delegates. It is with great pleasure to welcome you to AAMU and 2018 Annual Conference. I would like to thank you all for coming here and supporting us on this wonderful journey. We are all united here today to discuss the theme picked for this year's MEN, which is sealing the divide. First and most importantly, we must all remind ourselves that we are present here with open minds. This is a chance to debate topics you haven't debated before. This is also a chance for you to learn more about things that happen around you rather than just listening to them on the news and sitting around. This is a very important thing as we are becoming more globalized and countries are becoming more interconnected every day. And thus, MEN is going to help you to reach new heights. Whether you feel like you are confident or not, MEN is going to help you get over your fears and is going to help you become a new person. MEN is also going to help you improve on your communication and your debating skills. And so, through the rest of these two days, you will be able to improve on them both, in addition to becoming a leader and improving on your diplomatic skills. You will also have the chance to listen to other perspectives, learn of their beliefs, their cultures, their identities, and their significance. This, this experience is going to be like no other. So I am asking each and every one of you to please make the most out of it and get the most out of it. Because Amir and plays a vital role and a major role in shaping who you are as a character. Thank you for attending. We are all very excited to work with the bright minds filling up this theater today. Thank you. Picking a theme is not an easy task. Our outstanding head of debate worked immensely trying to pick the best suitable theme for this year's conference. Please put your hands together for our head of debate, Jafar al Nao. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to this year's AAMUN. And as the head of debate, I am excited to witness the debates which occur within the committees and the fire that will ignite within. The theme of our topics, Sealing the Divide, has been chosen after the series of unfortunate events that occurred across the globe. This year, we will mark our calendars as the seventh year that the Syrian war rages, the fourth year that the Crimean annexation has occurred. We witness uh, the tensions heighten on the Korean theater, and we find Myanmar and Bangladesh in tatters. The DRC, the war for Yemen, the Sahel, Afghanistan, and Venezuela. These are but a few of the many conflicts which plague the modern world. You, my friends, are the generations who will back and forth a future worthy of the ink that falls upon the pages of history. And so we choose you to conjoin into a mighty collective of nations that spans the globe in order to finally bestow peace and quell a storm which brews ever louder. You will take the skills you have forged within this MUN and you will develop them into a mighty Excalibur with which you will slay the serpents of conquest, war, famine and death. Good luck! And may you bask in the glory of justice and truth. And now, for our guest speaker, His Excellency Dr. Talal Abu Ghazali. Dr. Abu Ghazali was born on the 22nd of April, 1938, in Yaffa, Palestine. He was then deported as a refugee to Lebanon as a result of the 1948 war. Those events, however, did little to hinder Dr. Abu Ghazali as he completed his undergraduate education at the American University of Beirut. Majoring in sciences and business management, he also holds four PhD certificates and is a great ambassador of education. His organization runs the Talal Abu Ghazali Graduate School of Business. His Excellency has also established multiple international socio-economic participations, including being the chair of the United Nations Global Alliance for ICT and Development. His Excellency was also appointed twice to fulfill the role of an upper house senator in the Jordanian parliament. If ever there was a man to fit, fit to address the crowd of the AAMUN, it would be him. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Dr. Talal Abu Ghazali. I, 
I don't have to um, explain after what I've heard about my birthday, which happened to be last week, um, completing 80 years, 8-0 uh, of my life. And uh, I really feel, uh, have a, a very special feeling when I address uh, young when men and women of my age 60 years ago. I was, uh, I was in your teens 60 years ago. And I'm very happy to be invited to, to join you today. For the last uh, three decades, I have had a major role and many responsibilities. I chaired uh, in, at the UN. I chaired at least 15 UN task force forces and uh, commissions, including the probably most significant one, which is the UN ICT task force, which formulated uh, all the strategies for modern use of technology, um, mobile, laptop, etc. Uh, but let me, I, I want to time myself uh, so that nobody tells me that uh, it's time to stop talking. Uh, I, I, so I have a, a, a very close uh, connection to the UN. And I believe in the UN as much as I believe it, it, the level of confidence I have in the UN after this thorough experience depends on the level of my confidence in the people in the UN. The UN is nothing but uh, the people who are there. And the way I went in, to the UN is, is a long story. And I've never been on any position in the UN in any official capacity representing any country or elected uh, from any group of countries. It was always in my personal name as the chairman of Salah Abu Azali. Every, every position I have taken was in my independent uh, private capacity. In 1948, I was out of my home, Jaffa, as a refugee in Lebanon. And uh, I felt a great uh, injustice in being removed from my land uh, and my country for somebody who doesn't uh, belong to it. So I was, during the four hours walk every day to school, I was in a village called Ghaziyeh in the south, and the closest school was in Sidon. So I had to walk through two hours to and two hours back. Obviously, I couldn't afford any transport. I had to walk four hours a day. These four hours were very productive because I was trying at that time to formulate my plans for the future. And that's why I'm saying that you are at the right time, at, at the right age, because it was then that I decided that I want to avenge from my, fam from my enemy by being better than him. That is what my decision was. I didn't know how, but I said, uh, I want to prove to the world that I, as a Palestinian, are, am worthy of at least equal rights to anybody in the world, and that I deserve to be the owner of my own land, and that this injustice is proven to be unfair, unacceptable, and will not last. How? I thought that the only way to do it was through excellence. And excellence, the way to excellence is education. So my focus has been on education. And uh, I want you to, to imagine that a boy of 10 years old, I was 10 years old, had to go up to finish his university education without being able to pay one dollar. I didn't pay throughout my education life one dollar or one dinar or one whatever. 
because the only way I could get through was by being the top student in every class, in every year, in every school. And some people call that a hardship. Is it a hardship to be forced to be the top student in Lebanon to earn the only scholarship offered by UNRWA for university studies at the American University of Beirut? There was one scholarship for one person, and I had to earn it. I don't think that is a hardship. I think that is a privilege. If I had to be the top student and I'm forced to it, similarly when I went to the high school studies, they, I, I couldn't um, pay, so they said, sorry. I said, I want a scholarship. They said, scholarships are given after you prove and demonstrate that you deserve it. You don't get a scholarship by enrolling. So I went to the president of the school, like our distinguished president, at his home at night. And I said, uh, I want a scholarship. He said, do you know the rules? I said, yes, but I want to, to, to I have an offer for you. He said, what's your offer? I said, take me for one term, one month, whatever period under scholarship from you personally. If I prove to be the top student, you give me a scholarship. If I don't, you throw me out. You have nothing to lose. The class is 29. If it becomes 30, there is no problem. There is no additional cost. He said, I will, I will give you a chance. So I started writing, and he said, I, I sponsored so and so for one term, and on condition that he is the top student, I said no. The top student in all courses and as an average. Mm -hmm. He said, are you so confident of yourself? I said no. There is, a, it's, there is something which is strong, stronger than confidence. It's called need. Because I need it, I know that I'm going to make it. So I wouldn't let anything in my life stop me from achieving my mission. Coming back to the UN, my first course in, in computers was in 1965. I don't, you think that is Stone Age, 65. And it was in a room about this size, one computer called word processor. It, was, it wasn't called uh, computer, and it was um, a project by IBM. And it was the beginning of word processing, which is the beginning of computers. Somehow my mind told me that I should go there. At that time, I, I couldn't afford it, so I had a watch which I have earned as a prize in school. So I gave it to a friend who, gave, who paid me money to be able to go there. Because my, my firm said, oh, word processing, it's not in your field of business. In your field, I was an accountant. I started as an accountant in 1960. My mind told me at that time that this is not the end. This is the beginning. And I kept following the, the, the process of development of knowledge. It was the beginning of the knowledge age. And knowledge age progressed from word processors to computers. And then was the emergence of the internet. Um, I happened to be the, on the board of trust, on the board of the directors of the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, when I heard the word internet, it was again internet went through a long process of, from ARPA to many many stages, until it became a project, a project, not yet a product. And I said I I did some search and I found that there is a person called Ira Magaziner, 
who was the advisor to the U.S. president on the Internet. So I used my status on the International Chamber of Commerce to invite him to speak to us in Paris. And he came. And he came to tell us what the Internet will be. It was not there yet. It, this, I'm talking about the late 80s. He put on the screen a prototype of a desktop, which was, you don't see it now, it's not in existence anymore, and with a prototype of a keyboard and a dog using the computer. And it was written, nobody at the other end knows that I am a dog. And he said, this shows the greatness of the Internet, because the Internet is the only phenomenon in the world that can provide real and complete democracy. There is no democracy in any country, 100% democracy. And democracy definition varies from country to country, from culture to culture. So he said, the only thing that will make everybody in the world equal is the Internet. And we know that is true, because on the, at the Internet, we are all IP addresses. We are, the, the, machine, the system doesn't know us. We are just an address. That was amazing to me. So I decided to be involved, and I brought the first experiences and started developing my firm and myself to become a knowledge person. And if you ask me today, what are you, who are you, I say I'm a knowledge worker. I have, since I started realizing what the world is, I have been a knowledge worker trying to find what is coming and what is happening. And I, I hope by the end of this year I will publish my book on how you will live in the next uh, 60 years um, as a, a real prediction. It's not a, an imagination. It's a, it's, a, it's a real prediction, if that terminology means anything, of, of a, the, how life would be for every citizen in the world in every way of life, in every walk, whether it's education, business, government, etc. Um, so I, I was, when, when uh, Kofi Annan wanted to set up this ICT task force to formulate ICT strategies for the world, he picked me. Out of 52 persons, 30 of them representing the major governments of the world, uh, and eight persons from business, global business community. This, the other seven were heads of the major ICT companies and myself and the UN system, World Bank, etc. It was two months after September 11, on November 21. And I keep repeating this story because I want you all to feel what I felt. His, uh, the Secretary General said to, it was in a, a technical meeting, it was not a political meeting. Of course, I chaired many meetings at the UN Assembly. I addressed the Assembly, I addressed uh, the various uh, agencies, uh, UN agencies, and I'm currently serving in a number of capacities still on UN. For example, I'm, I've been elected recently to the high-level advisory board of the UN on the impact of economic decisions on society, the social impact. The UN has always been concerned with the growth, with the what we call economic indicators. But what is the impact of these economic indicators on the individual? So we are now a board that is looking at social indicators, plus, etc. So, but. When I was, uh, when we were at that meeting of finance, said, I wanted to elect a board. So they elected a board of eight members, and I was one of them. He said, I want you, I nominate a chairman, 
on behalf of the UN, who happened at that time to be the president of Costa Rica. And I wanted to elect one by election. So we were two co-chairs. And they elected me. I asked to speak, and in these technical meetings, you, do, you don't have speeches. I said, I want just to say thank you. I said, go ahead. I said, I thank you for electing me as your chairman, knowing that I'm a Palestinian, a Jordanian, an Arab, and a Muslim, which means that all the terrorist accusations that were floating around are in me, and you elected me. Thank you. The American ambassador was the first to start clapping like you did. His name is David Gross, and a great friend of mine. And the whole meeting was clapping. So at lunch, Kofi Annan told me, you know, sometimes a sentence is better than 1,000 speeches. At the UN, and this is what some of my advice to the young UN leaders, sometimes a trendy statement or a trendy word or close is much better than a long, long article or speech. For example, at one of the occasions on the UN, a representative of the enemy, and I have only one enemy called Palestine, I don't, uh, Israel. I don't have any other enemy in the world. Even those who hate me are my friends. And I want to teach you this love for, your, for the people who hate you. Because the person who hates me serves me as much as the person who loves me. The person who loves me gives me courage and support and passion. And I admire him and I'm grateful to him. The person who hates me is sitting there watching me to make mistakes so that he can jump at me. So he's doing me a free service because he's protecting me from myself. So I thank my enemy and I, say I thank my competitor because he's doing me a free service. So I, I, I wanted to say that sometimes, one, one day I was uh, talking about uh, the Palestinian rights. And uh, the representative of the enemy, I don't like to call it a state because it's not a state, it's a, it's a, it's a power of occupation. So the representative of the enemy say, why do you hate Israel, what he calls Israel? Israel is a peaceful country. I responded, I said, I fully agree. Israel is a peaceful country. And he was happy. I said, it's full of pieces. A peace from, Palestine, from Egypt, a peace from Lebanon, a peace from Syria, and a big peace from Palestine. And everybody there was laughing, and that made him shut up. You know, it was a very simple play on words between peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, and peace, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Israel is full of pieces from the Arab world. It is, it is a peaceful country. That is true about Israel. But this is, um, I, didn't, I never meant this meet, my speech to be political, but I wanted to show you how you can use words it, it, in, in, instead of long, long presentations. And in, in, at the UN, there is no power of passion or love. There is power of cards. And I have learned this from many great leaders. One of the great leaders I learned from was uh, President Jimmy Carter, who told me once, never use the power you have, because once you use it, it's gone. Always make the other person at the other end, or your op opponent, realize that you have the power, but don't threaten with it and don't use it. But make him aware that you have it. If you make him aware that you have it, he is doubtful what's going to happen. He's doubtful that whether you have it or not. And uh, if you use it, it's, it's gone. 
It's like you have a, 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 a bullet and you shoot. It's gone. The bullet is finished. It's gone. But as long as you, you keep what power you have, you, you, you keep your power. So I decided to spend my life to serve my nation, the Arab world. I started with a mission, and sometimes, and many times, they ask me, what is the prescription for your career, what you have done? I said, I started with a mission. People usually start with ambition. I want to be in a position, or I want to be rich, or I want whatever. I never had that ambition. I had a mission that I want to prove to the world that I'm better than my enemy. And that makes you like a soldier fighting to win a war. And it's an endless mission. It doesn't stop by being elected as minister or elected as chairman of a company or whatever. Today I chair many of the UN agencies, of course, I chaired, and, and more importantly, the Arab um, organizations. And in this place of excellence, in this school of excellence, and we are very proud that uh, we have worked on one of the projects we did. Uh, your contribution, sir, was uh, immensely appreciated in uh, developing uh, standards of accreditation and evaluation of schools. Because I chair the Arab Organization for Quality Assurance and Education, which is one of the uh, Arab League agencies, and also the Arab Organization for Research in Business, research, research in Education, excuse me. And this is going to come very soon. We have been working with the European Union in partnership, my organization and the European Union, have now established a special internet line which would link all research centers in the Arab world to their equals in Europe and the world. That's because, unfortunately, this part of the world is at the lowest level of research. And now I want to come to the theme, sealing the divide. In my capacity as UN Global Alliance for ICT for Development, I was in charge of organizing what is known as WISIS, World Summit on Information Society, which was held in Geneva and in Tunis. And we were talking about, at that time, another divide called the economic divide, the wealth divide, how there is poverty and wealth, and how can we, and how, between people and between nations. And I drafted the unfortunately unimplemented uh, develop, millennium, millennium Development Goals, uh, which were adopted for, to be achieved by 2015. And now we are talking about other goals called the a new, a new, just a new name, but it's another uh, at, at attempt to to, to, to try to bridge divides. But that doesn't bother me, and I'm not interested in that. Because in my mind, and in my knowledge as an old man, the most serious divide is the divide resulting from the knowledge revolution. It is not the wealth divide. I have lived on a sandwich all day, and I'm still surviving. I didn't have a jacket. My mother made, it out, made me a jacket out of a blanket. Doesn't bother me. What bothers me is that one day, serving on one of the UN agencies, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization, sitting next to a chairman of one of the largest pharmaceutical companies, we were talking about the future of the pharmaceutical industries. And among other things, he mentioned that this world of 
pharmacy is going to change. There will be no doctors in future. There will be a genetic map of every one of us, and according to the genetic map, the pharmacist will make the medicine that is suitable to you. That's alarming. Where are we with that, on that? Bill Clinton announced the genetic uh, mapping uh, 20 years ago. Where are we in the Arab world in genetic mapping? Worse than that. I happen to be on a panel like this with Bill Gates. And I asked him, if I want you to, to tell me how do you describe the rest of this century, meaning the next 80 years or 50, 70 or 90 years, he said artificial intelligence. Interesting. I need to, to know what artificial intelligence is. I didn't know about it. Just like I never knew about intellectual property, and I have to happen to be in a meeting in San Francisco, and I heard the word intellectual property, and I'm talking about 1966, 67, and I did my research, and I found out what it is. And that's why yesterday I was talking on Sky News on uh, Intellectual Property Day at the United Nations. We are now the largest company in the world, not in the region, in the world, including U.S. of America, etc., in intellectual property. Because I learned when I studied what intellectual property is that this is, is this, this is part of the making of the future. So artificial intelligence is now the name of the century. If you want to call this century, you call it artificial intelligence. I, have, I am an educator by life, my life since the beginning. Since I started my group in 72, our mission statement was how to develop capacities of the Arab world in order to build economies and future of the region. That is done through capacity, capacity building, which is one form of education. I learned that artificial intelligence means, in simple words, making the machines more intelligent and making the human beings more intelligent also. People think that artificial intelligence means developing things like robots or sensor sensors, etc., etc., machine learning. No, artificial intelligence is going to make our brain, as, as has the capacity of the computer, to be able to store millions of facts in this brain, and to make the computer equal to our brain in its capacity to think and analyze. So it's a two-way track. Now, what worries me in this two-way track, and if you're talking about sealing the divide, and this is the time to talk about it now, don't waste your time talking about the problems in Libya, in Venezuela, in Cuba, in, in Palestine, even in Palestine. Think of how we can become knowledge societies. That is the way to win the future. And that is the way that I think my mission is from now on, from a year at least until now. And this is what, why I was in, in MIT, at MIT and at Harvard last week, mobilizing the Arab graduates of Ivy League universities to serve this region in making us go to, uh, towards the knowledge uh, era. Now, what is the divide I'm talking about? I'm talking about that about artificial intelligence being able to make my mind and my brain better than your mind and brain if I use intelligent, artificial intelligence. So we're talking about not difference in education which you can earn, nor difference in, 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 in wealth which you can earn, we're talking about a human being which is, who is better than another human being. There will come a day when humanity will be 
in two parts, retarded Stone Age human beings like myself, and human beings who had the benefit of artificial intelligence to become superior human beings, not superior in knowledge or in wealth, superior in your faculties, in your, in your lifespan, in your memory capacity, in your ability to, 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 to produce, in your strength, in everything. In other words, we will have a, a very alarming divide between the better human being and the worse human being. This is what worries me. And this is what I'm working on to, 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 to raise uh, the concern about uh, the result of that. I don't want my nation, the Arab world, to be in, in the category of retarded and inferior human beings. Human beings. And I'm not talking about the divides you're talking about, poverty or sickness or depra political deprivation. That's all easy. What is difficult is if I have to sit next to an American or a fin Finnish, a Finland person, and he looks down at me like I looks down at an, at an animal who doesn't know anything and who doesn't have any power. That is the serious divide. And I'm not talking about a dream. I'm talking about a real thing that is on, in process. And that is why I decided to start uh, in this country to which I owe a lot, and to, especially to His Majesty the King. I decided, and I, last week, we were uh, granted license to start a new co university college, Talal Abu Ghazali College for in Innovation. We will teach the sciences that are not taught in universities. We will teach, and not to, to teach you to become expert, no, to become an inventor. This is a school to, to graduate inventors and not learned people. In other words, the four years are how to help you, help you, not teach you, help you in the process of invention so that you come up with an invention to graduate. If you do not invent, you don't get the university degree. The degree is earned by an invention and not by an exam and not by grading your courses. There are no, we don't grade courses because we teach you how to become an inventor and in different fields of knowledge, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, cybersecurity, data management, etc. In the fields that are going to make the future world and to make the future leaders. This is the thing that we are worrying about and this is part of our contribution. At Talal Abu Ghazali Knowledge Forum, we have a plan by the year 2040 to help the process of making Jordan a knowledge society. I hope we can make it. I hope we can contribute to it. And we are dedicated, and I'm very proud to say that we have many of the great leaders and minds in this country who are committed to work, I think now about 1,500, of top experts in various fields who are giving their time at no cost, just as a contribution in how to make Jordan Finland. And if we become Finland, we will not have unemployment, we will not have war, we will not have deficit in budget. We will not have. We don't have any debt. Because, and I tell you what is the difference between a knowledge society that produces knowledge and sell it Finland, and a society like Jordan, which is not a knowledge society, which buys knowledge. Our GDP compared to Finland and we are equal in, num in population and in other aspects. We don't, we, our circumstances are the same. 
Finland is 180 billion GDP, ours is 40. That's, that, that is how much difference it makes to become a knowledge society. So, in, in, in order to do that, we don't, we don't just talk. We have created a number of tools in Talal Abu Ghazali organization, including tool for eliminating internet literacy, tool for, as I said, uh, promoting creators and inventors, tools for having the knowledge awareness in, throughout the Arab world, and not just in Jordan, and in media. I have just been recently elected or nominated or assigned the responsibility as chairman of the board of the Hayal Arabiya Lil Bath Al Fadai, which is supposed to oversee over 1,000 TV stations, etc., throughout the world. These should be tools for knowledge, not tools for destruction of knowledge. And I'm going to fight that battle, insha'Allah. Having said uh, that, I just want one comment on, on your agenda. You talk about cryptocurrency. Don't waste your time. There will be no cryptocurrency. The U.S. rules the world through its control of the money market. It will not allow any currency in 1948, at Britain Wood, and this is the reason and the secret between the very close strategic relation between the U.S. and Britain, Britain gave up the sterling as a reserve currency in the world. And the only reserve currency in the world today is the dollar. And the U.S. has more power than the U.N., through its control of the monetary system. The U.S. can tell its banks, you're not allowed to work with the bank called Talal Abu Ghazali. And Talal Abu Ghazali Bank is finished. Finished. Because it cannot transfer, because every dollar, since we said that the dollar is the currency of the world, every dollar transfer has to go through the New York Clearing Center. In other words, to make Long story short, the U.S. controls the world through the dollar as a reserve and through its control of the world financial system. Cryptocurrency is a game. Work on it like a game. Enjoy it. Learn about it. Debate about it. But don't worry about it. It will not come. It will not be there. There will always be, as long as, be, as there is the U.S. of America, there is... Well, you know, Saddam Hussein tried to move away from the dollar, and he was gone. Now, no, no, car, no country in the world can live without being under the dollar system. Now, to close, the divide I want you to concentrate on. Please, young leaders of the future, you can't contribute when you discuss the problem in Korea. You debate. It's hot air. You cannot contribute when you talk about Libya or about Syria. I have my heart in Syria and, and in Libya. But I don't spend my time debating it because my debate would not contribute anything. What I can do and what I should do in the few days remaining of my life and what you should do is how to transform the Arab world into a knowledge society, starting with your country, Jordan, and every country in the Arab world, because we are one interrelated region. That is the concern of the future, and that is the only divide I worry about. They can stay in Israel for another 50 years. They will leave. But if I am an inferior human being, I'm not going to be able to do that. 
If I want to serve Palestine, I have to be a knowledge worker. If I want to serve this great country and its great king, I have to become a knowledge leader and to lead this country into becoming part of the knowledge world. The knowledge divide is my only concern. And if I can convince you to spend your time, because this is something where you can make a difference. You can debate, it's fine, and learn how debate is. But the, where you can make your difference is on how to become a knowledge worker like me and how to become an agent of change in this country to make it a knowledge society and to make the Arab world part of the emerging new divide as a knowledge leader in the new divide. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending this session, and especially His Excellency Dr. Talal Abu Ghazali. He truly touched our hearts. Thank you. Honorable guests, esteemed teachers, respected presidents and chairs, fellow secretariat, and dear delegates, it is my utmost honor and pleasure to welcome you all to this fifth annual session of the Amman Academy Model United Nations. I, on behalf of the whole secretariat, would like to express how proud we feel that we made it all the way here. I am proud of each and every one of my team. I am proud to be here and I am proud to have created this fundamental educational experience. Last December, a secretariat of six members was put together. By today, the six executive group of students has evolved to become members of the AAMUN family. Here we are together, we are Arabs, we are young, we are ambitious, and at this moment, perhaps, we are rather sleepy. I would like gladly to announce uh, this conference's theme to be Sealing the Divide. Sealing the Divide evokes many emotions and thoughts within me. It represents the million of millions of refugees out there, the struggles of our planet and our presence, uh, it, and it breaks the hard bound of prejudice and discrimination. We see wars consume citizens and governments, leaders and conquerors, uh, blacks and whites, westerns and easterns, and many others. Seven billion people live in 195 countries across seven continents and all within one globe. But this just makes me arrive to my next question. Are we united or are we divided? Are we united with more than 65 million people forcibly displaced? Of those, 22.5 million are refugees. Are we united with 20 ongoing civil wars? Or maybe, with more, uh, are we united with more than 80% of our world's population living in complete poverty? Or perhaps, are we united on our social media and Facebook pages? The United Nations is responsible for creating unity. And that is what we are trying to achieve here at the AAMUN. We will find solutions for people with security concerns, people with economically uh, uh, driven concerns, and people with no basic human rights. We also see our leaders become cruel embodiments of heartless beasts. We see them disregarding unjustly, proclaiming a deceptive truth. We witness their blatant disregard of the world's stability as though it is all a chess game with pawns made of worthless wood. They push the world off the brink of destruction. These leaders use the world as a sandbox in which to carelessly build and destroy castles built of billions of souls that inhabit this planet. We are the next generation. We are the leaders of tomorrow. And we are the citizens of this world. 
there, are, there is not a man amongst us who stands taller than those around him. Not a Jew, Gentile, black man or white, whatever creed might God have formed his mold of. Whatever race or gender, we are all equal within the eyes of the ultimate beholder. The model United Nations is a, pla is a place to prove excellence, dedication and ambition. Students go on a two-day journey looking for solutions of, uh, for some of the world's most concerning issues. It is a great opportunity to make use of all the knowledge you are gaining at the school, uh, at the activities you do outside of your classroom, and all the love you have for the heat of the debate. MUN is one of the life-changing experiences at high school. It exposes high school students and it Im Im embeds communication, leadership, critical thinking, and open-mindedness across them all. We are in a place where knowledge can be highly made, or made, made use of. We are within a sanctuary uh, which values the more technical aspects behind the academics. We are interested in the usage of those academic skills in order to transform the world into a glowing, pristine utopia. I have a vision of making this conference one of the nationally recognized conferences of modern United Nations. Amman Academy has been a center of excellency and pride, and we think that it's now the right time for it to become one of the country's leaders in this sector. We have high faith in our students and in their ability to stand out, to think differently, and to become, indeed, the leaders of tomorrow. I would like to reach the end of my speech with thanking you all for being here today and for contributing to, th for the, uh, to this conference. Your presence and efforts are highly appreciated. I want to give a special thanks to Mr. Suhaib al Jauhari, our first supporter and the teacher that always motivated us to reach where we are. And now, finally, as the Secretary General of the fifth annual session of the AAMUN, I would like to declare that AAMUN is now open.